Facebook celebrates its 15th anniversary today, but it arrives at the milestone mired in controversy. Roger McNamee was an advisor for founder Mark Zuckerberg during the early years of the company. His book, Zuck, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, comes out tomorrow. In it, he says the social media giant is a threat to democracy, public health, and users' privacy. He also says the social media site is terrible for America and needed to be changed or change. And Roger McNamee is here with us. Good to see you. Thanks, Fly. Heavy stuff. I mean, that is pretty, you know, yeah, it's incendiary what you're well, suggesting. Think about it for just a moment. The issue that we've got, we all love using Facebook. We love using Instagram. We love social media in general. The problem is that they have taken advantage of all the trust that was built up in tech over the last 50 years. And first they built habits and the habits turned into addictions. And when we get addicted to things, you know, when we're checking the phone before we pee in the morning, you know you're really hooked on something. And in that context, you're vulnerable. And they have not done a good job of protecting the people who use their products from bad actors who want to manipulate them. And then, I don't know if you've seen, but just last week, Facebook was caught a couple of times doing things relative to minors. First, there was the story about minors playing games and running up huge credit card mm -hmm. bills. And then second, there was the story of them and Google doing what they called research products that spy on the people who use them. And paying people. Well, the weird part of it was yeah. that they weren't paying them nearly enough for what they were doing. Mm. And so, and they were preying on a lot of people who didn't understand the implications of what they were doing. And they were doing this on purpose. These are not accidents. And I think the problem is not the economic power of these companies, but the political power. The fact that no one elected them, there's no accountability, and they have huge influence on everything that goes on around us. Right? Political campaigns have to run on Instagram now. And you look at that and you go, that wouldn't have to be bad. It's just that the way the business model works, their incentives are to take advantage of us. So is it possible for Facebook to exist without some of the data collection practices it's been criticized for? In other words, maybe you don't make $100 billion, you only make $50 billion, which is a significant amount of money for a company. So the issue, Vlad, that's exactly the right question because the problem is the business model. The advertising model that they have creates incentives to, to basically manipulate our attention so we spend more time on the site. If you change the business model, there's nothing about the way the apps work per se that is a problem. The issue is that they have incentives to do this massive surveillance and then this manipulation. And as I look at it, what I've been asking them to do for the last three years is to just understand that there's something wrong with that business model today. That at the scale that they operate at, there's just too much damage that you can do when you don't have you know, essentially circuit breakers and things to break emotional contagion when it breaks out. And so you see bullying on Instagram and you see inappropriate videos in YouTube kids and then you see things that recruit and train terrorists on YouTube and you see disinformation everywhere. And their attitude is not their problem. And I look at it and go, I'm sorry, that is your problem. So this is the dilemma that I've been wrestling with um, since the 2016 election, since we found out that we are being manipulated through social media by sort of various actors, right, trying to undermine our democracy. Um, is how much of the responsibility is on the user. I kind of go back and forth. I see friends of mine that I consider intelligent sharing to me what is an obviously a false news item. And I think, wh you're, why are you being suckered in again? I mean, don't we play a role in this? Well, Facebook and Google would like you to believe that it's all your fault. And I would argue that since, that it's a little bit like the whole issue with OxyContin. Do you think that the people who get addicted to opioids because they're giving them as painkillers after something goes wrong and the company that makes them consciously packages them in a way that creates addiction, I would argue that, that there's more than one person to blame in that situation. And I think that is precisely what's going on here. Mm -hmm. That yes, we all have a responsibility, but we don't have all the responsibility. Not when the people on the other side have a massive artificial intelligence that knows everything about you and knows where your buttons are and pushes them at will, not for your benefit, but for their benefit. Can I ask you about the benefits of Facebook? What is it that people get out of it? I, 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 and, I, and I have a Facebook page. I rarely post to it. If I post to it, it's a picture of my band and I playing guitar 
or a vacation well, trip. But hang on, I you, don't, you've oh, just but, you've hit the magic word for me. Yeah. I mean, I've been playing in bands forever, and my bands literally run their entire communication with our fans over Facebook. Okay. And we have more or less since the band began 11 years ago. And for that, it's extraordinary. Facebook's amazing for organizing events. Facebook's really good for keeping in touch with, you know, family and friends that you don't see right, very often, right. right? And those are the good sides. The problem that you get with it is, again, they've got political power. And if they didn't have or exercise the impact on democracy, then a lot of this conversation wouldn't be necessary. Right. But because of the huge impact on the way our whole social structure works, I mean, think about it. They talk about how polarized we are as a country. Well, where did that come from? I mean, we're always a little bit polarized, but if you look at the history of it, it tracks exactly to social media. Social media has an economic incentive to peak outrage and fear. And those are the things that have caused us to come apart and not be able to communicate. So they've got a statement here uh, to CBS News. Facebook says, we take criticism seriously. Over the past two years, we fundamentally changed how we operate to better protect the safety and security of people using Facebook. The reality is Roger McNamee hasn't been involved with Facebook for a decade. Your response? My response is really simple, which is that they were caught by the housing and urban development creating advertising tools that allow discrimination in housing and violation of the Fair Housing Act. They claimed they'd fix it. And guess what? ProPublica did a study after study after study. They never did fix it. The FTC had a consent decree that said they would no longer share user data without prior informed consent. Cambridge Analytica came three years after that. These guys, I think they have made changes, and a few of them, particularly electionary, have been valuable. But the truth is that they're all cosmetic. The problem is the business model. Until they change that, until they change the incentives, none of these things is going to fix the problem. And, you know, the fact that this isn't about me. If, if people don't like me as the messenger, that's fine. But let's engage with the substance of the, of the issues. Let's actually have a conversation about what kind of a country we want to have, what kind of democracy we want to have, and whether Facebook and Instagram and Google and YouTube are helping or hurting. I would argue that they're hurting. And their responses to say something about me, you know, God bless. But I mean, that speaks more about them than it does about go, me. Before you go, because you're an early investor in Facebook, because you know Mark Zuckerberg well, what are we to make of him then when we see him in front of uh, lawmakers saying, you know, we've got to do better? Uh, you know, he certainly seems sincere to a certain degree. What are we to make of this so man? So the thing to understand is Did I, this thing get away from him? I always had enormous admiration for both Mark and Cheryl. I think they're two of the most capable people I've ever known. And I think, in reality, success maybe blinded them to some of the issues that came up here. You know, I don't think they're, one, I don't think they're bad people. Two, I don't think they mean badly. But I do think they are so convinced of their vision that they w are willing to excuse almost any means that they have to go through to get there. And again, I look at this, it's, it's, this isn't about me, okay? This is about a set of issues, this is about the country. And I'm gonna do my best to just try to make sure conversations happen and that, that Mark and Cheryl get their day in court, but they have, to, they have to come and be more honest with us about what they're doing. It's a real interesting thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger McNamee, thanks for being here with us. My pleasure, thank you.